speak. I'm here in uh, Nantucket and um, I have the honor to talk to Jackie McNish from, uh, I think, Toronto, Canada. She wrote a book, uh, Losing the Signal, which I spent eight enjoyable hours and I already reviewed it. So I wanted to talk about, her, about you, about why you wrote the book, what is happening in Canada, how do they feel about Blackberry. So first, um, I know you, are, uh, you wrote a bunch of books and you work for the, I think, Wall Street Journal. Can you tell a little bit about yourself, Jackie? I'm a senior correspondent, business correspondent with the Globe and Mail, which is the national newspaper in Canada. And I did work for the Wall Street Journal in the 1980s. I started my career there. And um, I have written many books, but I think this is probably the most, has been the most interesting and compelling story for me to write because uh, the whole story of Blackberry, the rise and fall all of this happens in a very short period of time. It's one of the fastest technology races we've seen in our generation from the minute the first BlackBerry was introduced in 1999 until Silicon Valley decided it wanted a piece of this market until ultimately its business collapsed uh, by 2013. All yeah. of that happened in 15 years. Think of that, 15 years. That's the lifespan of a chihuahua. Yeah, it was... Uh, and think I, of what... Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think also it was it was very special because in America, you know, one big uh, one big tech company or another, uh, they come and go. But for Canada, this was very special. I mean, how big is the tech sector, and what are you, what are your icons in Canada, uh, of which BlackBerry suddenly became the number one? We before BlackBerry arrived, we had a very small tech sector. Uh, our biggest success and failure prior. After that was Northern Telecom, uh, the, the uh, telecommunications company that basically collapsed after the dot-com bubble burst in the, in the early uh, 2000s. So BlackBerry was a Canadian champion. It was a small, small company that started above a bagel store in Waterloo, which I'm sure most of your subscribers have never heard of. And it well, is Waterloo a great we know, Canadian but <laughs> Waterloo we know, but then in a <laughs> yes. whole different context, yeah. Yes, in and, and which has relevance in this context as well. Um, but what's fascinating about BlackBerry is that, uh, you know, this is people that came together. They, Jim Balsilli, Mike Lazaridis, the founders, and they had the audacity to think that they could be better than Motorola, Nokia, and all of the other players who were racing to provide the, the, the whole notion of data over networks, the thought that you could bring a piece of the internet to a handheld device and they beat Palm. Remember Palm? They were the big popular device of the time in the late 90s, but they didn't provide internet. They couldn't figure out how to make that connection. And BlackBerry figured it out. And the most amazing part of the first part of the company's story for me is that they survived. There were so many big competitors that wanted to kill this company. So they not only had a great technology, they had a great entrepreneurial survival skills that allowed them to stay alive while they slowly built their market. Yeah, so where, when, did, uh, when did the Canadians become proud of BlackBerry? What, what, what year was that? When did it become you know, more in the, public, uh, in the public eye? BlackBerry grew slowly in, Can in the Canadian perception because it started as a paging company and there were a lot of pagers. There was Motorola's or other companies that were in that space. But once they were able to bring you a device with a keyboard and uh, people, BlackBerry is very smart, they started to introduce it to the bankers and the lawyers. And I remember the first time that I, I met a lawyer who was on his BlackBerry who would pull, pull out this little machine uh, in the, the late 1990s and say, look, I can get my email right away. And it felt right away like it was a very if you had this device, you were an important person. You were part of a special club of people <laughs> that was able to bring the internet to your to your palm. So people people in business sort of knew about it first because BlackBerry targeted the sort of elite business crowd. And then when people like Oprah and Madonna started waving the BlackBerry up and said, this thing is amazing, we love it, Canadians started to take another look at this sort of nerdy little technology company and said, what's going on here? And then we became very proud. I mean, I, I, I liken it to Canada is a land of hockey. And BlackBerry was the company that won the Stanley Cup, the ultimate hockey trophy, because it was recognized internationally as the best in the game. And yeah, there was so a lot first, of local pride. 
So first, it had to be recognized by international and by the by Wall Street and by uh, the American uh, artists before the Canadians were going. Hmm, maybe this is something because they also were not so enthusiastic in fund. They were they were funding the company, but they were not giving it raving uh, amount of PE factors. That only started when they went to also Wall Street and get an across get a cross uh, listing. So uh, and then and then what did what did Jim and uh, and I and, think absolutely. And what did Jim and Mike then become in the when when it became an icon? What were what happened to the two founders? What they were they what were they for uh, Canada? People were very proud of, and I think that they were much much more focused on Mike Lazaridis, who was the engineer and the brains behind the device. Jim Baldelli is a very aggressive, sharp-elbowed entrepreneur who is a terrible communicator, and when it People had difficulty understanding what his point was because what made him very successful in business, which was being as ruthless as possible to survive, uh, didn't exactly make him a warm and cuddly figure in the public eye. Whereas Mike Lazarita was this sort of um, charming, uh, serious uh, man of integrity in the laboratory who was revered as a great inventor um, and not the hard-edged businessman, but someone who kept thinking about how to make the world a better place. Always interested in quantum physics, always interested in, in, in conservative traditional engineering values, conservation, you know, conserving bandwidth on the networks, so very much an old school, likable, like your favorite uncle, you know, professor type of a, an image. Yeah, and then and he, but he was also not that great on stage, I remember. He, I mean, he always made me cringe <laughs> when he wanted to be doing a Steve Jobs kind of uh, uh, act. That was not his thing. No, you're, you're absolutely right. When Mike Lazaridis walked on the stage, it was like someone was reading uh, a technology manual. That's how he spoke, and that's how he assumed the rest of the world spoke. And you've raised a very important point, which is neither Mike nor Jim, the two CEOs, were good communicators. And when you compare that to the great skills of, of Steve Jobs and Apple, he was a brilliant communicator. He really knew how to capture the public imagination. Imagine creating a little, uh, a new phone and having it being called the Jesus phone. He had a cult-like following because people believed in his vision and the way he sold that vision. BlackBerry never had that skill. Oh. Hi. There we are again. Okay. We <laughs> we lost the signal. Yeah, that's it indeed. We lost the signal. Okay, um, so we're then talking about what happens when the company was slowing down. 2010. I mean, it took a long time. 2007, the iPhone came, and 2010 was the best. 2011 was even a better year, and only from 2012, sales went down. When did the Canadians have the feeling that things were uh, going the wrong way, and what happened? I think that it was it was a, there were there were a couple of events. There, a lot of people loved BlackBerry research and motion so much that I think there was a lot of denial here in Canada because, as you say, their sales and their revenue was exploding because they were selling internationally. And what Canadians didn't understand was that this is a company that was that could barely keep up with the demand. At the same time, it was facing its greatest danger, which was competition from Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs, Google with Android, set their sights on this market, recognized right away it's going to be bigger than computers. And the, Can the average Canadian didn't understand what a serious threat Apple and Google represented. They loved and were so proud of BlackBerry that it really wasn't until about the 2010 period that they started to realize that something was wrong. And there were, there were two key moments. One, when BlackBerry decided to compete with the touchscreen phone, signing up with Verizon, the American carrier, to create a phone. I know, it's cringy. <laughs> to create a phone called the Storm, the unfortunately named Storm. They decided, this is a very important point in the company's history, because they decided at this point that they were going to become followers, not innovators. And what they decided to do was to try and beat Apple at its own game with a touchscreen phone. But because this is the innovator's dilemma, because Mike Lazaridis loved the 
the keyboard so much he couldn't give it all up. He had to create this tactile phone that if you clicked the glass screen, you'd get that sound, that tactile sound that you might get with a keyboard because they created this little dome within the phone. But unfortunately, they were pushed too hard to go too fast. They had the arrogance to believe that they could create this whole new technology within a year. And what happened was a very disastrous phone with flawed software, flawed mechanics. It just didn't work. As Stephen Fry, the British columnist, said, it was a stinker. And it just, it just I think, every phone that they ever made was returned. So that caused their the first... Of, first damage to their brand and their yeah. brand was perfection right yeah for me it was really interesting i always bought my own blackberries and i always and i never uh, accepted anything from uh, from blackberry but then they invited me to come to, uh, to they flew me to canada to waterloo and i met mike for the first time actually and a bunch of other guys and they wanted to show me the storm as a special thing and i and i looked at it and i and it was also a drama because I was going to make a video of that phone. And then when I was making the video, when I, I came with a cameraman and then they said, oh, no, you cannot, uh, you cannot make videos when I arrived in Canada. You know, they, they flew me first class with a cameraman to Waterloo. I met everybody in the company and then, uh, and then I met Mike with his, bla with his storm and he says, oh, you cannot make a video. That's forbidden. And I go like, you're an idiot. And then I looked at the storm and I go like, what is this? This is horrible. <laughs> it's just like I was, that was the first, so that was for me a personal disappointing moment. And I never liked the storm, but, um, and, 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 and they are also masters of, of, of PR prevention. They are really not good. If, if they go with their evangelist, they do stupid things with them. But anyway, it was, um, the, the storm was a stinker, a big stinker. And didn't you feel personally, as a huge fan of BlackBerry, that it was a betrayal of what you believed in? That it was so wrong, the turn that they took was so wrong, and everything wow. that the BlackBerry represented, its simplicity, its convenience, its intuitiveness, didn't exist in the storm. It felt like you'd been betrayed by your best well, friend. Well, I actually was so loyal to BlackBerry that I really wanted to believe in the concept. I thought, okay, this is an interesting concept. This might work. Uh, but then you have to execute it flawlessly, and it it wasn't executed flawlessly, and it took years to be executed in a little bit of a way, and and, and it was so small what an advantage it was. But I mean, I was personally insulted when uh, when the Z10 came out, and um, the, the first BlackBerry 10 phone, and then that uh, that German CEO, what's his name? He uh, Torsten. yeah. Torsten. Yeah. Thorsten Heinz and then he said oh yeah we're not going to make one with a keyboard no we're going to make one with a touch screen and I go like and I had to wait four years before the classic arrived with the keys and with the and then when this arrived I went to then I only went to see to do Blackberry 10 before yeah. I couldn't touch the whole thing and that really that I felt was a, uh, a disconnect with uh, with us the users I yes. love the operating system the BB10 I really hated that the shortcuts were not there, the keys were not there, and a lot of things were not there. But, I mean, in principle, it's a good system. And if they would have let Apple go its way and focus on everybody who wants a keyboard needs a BlackBerry, everybody who doesn't need a keyboard then goes to Google and to... Uh, that, and that, that, that would have... Then maybe 20% of the market or 10% of the market they would have been able to keep. But uh, now I felt personally very hurt. <laughs> And you were and you were disappointed, and of course the next the next fatal blow was the tablet, the playbook, and what happened there again, they were following they decided that they could play play with Apple and compete with them in the tablet sector, go after the iPad, and again, the problem was execution. I mean imagine Blackberry introducing a wireless tablet without native email. I mean it was just incredible, and you've touched on a very important point, which is execution. Up until the storm, BlackBerry was renowned for its execution. The, the, the quality of the product, uh, the simplicity of the use of, of the device. You never needed a manual to use a BlackBerry. It was intuitive. You understood it right away. No one could figure out the storm. It didn't work. And then you get a playbook, and it doesn't have the thing that BlackBerry is known most for, which is email. They lost their way. And I think that execution is the key. And 
Sean and I, when we wrote this book, our working title, which we shared with each other, was The Startup That Never Grew Up. I mean, this is a company that went from introducing the BlackBerry in 1998 to having 50% of the market in less than 10 years, a market it created. It went from zero to a $20 billion company, and it, could, it, it, didn't, it never got a chance to grow up. They, they, there weren't enough adults with experience running the company. They were hiring so quickly that they used to hire buses on Waterloo to send hundreds of people on, on new hire Mondays to a convention center where, where who did they meet? A video of, of <laughs> these senior executives. So there was, there, was no, there was no glue in this culture. There, there was no clear communications from the leaders. There was no culture because it was still a culture under development where they were just racing to keep up with demand. And when they faced their greatest threats, a, you know, a really sad thing happened. Mike Lazaridis and Jim Balsilli fall apart. And so you get these silos in the company that's still immature, that's not seasoned, and you've got rivalries, you've got betrayals, you've got confusion. People didn't know what to do, so paralysis set in. They didn't know which way they were going. And frankly, the whole thing is, is a, a tragedy that's easy for us to look back at and say, oh, they made mistakes. But I have a great deal of compassion for them because they really grew too fast. They couldn't keep up with their success. Yeah. Yeah. And until 2012, actually, sales increased. Uh, even though the market share uh, went down, the sales and the, and the amount of money and the amount of people and the amount of uh, devices still grew. And it only in 2013, it went worldwide. It went down for the first time in, an, in, a, in a real spin. Yeah, I, I also feel very, uh, I feel personally at a loss that, uh, that they went so down the tube so fast. And it was... Uh, it was such a waste. It was such a waste, and um, so that's why I'm also very interested in, um, in 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 what's BlackBerry now, where where it's going. First, um, you uh, you 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 did a little bit. You talked a little bit about what Jim did. He went into art, and 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 Mike. I think Mike is still more part of the community, the way you describe it. What what is Mike at the moment now in uh, in in Canada? It's a very interesting story where he's at now. In his final years at BlackBerry, the company agreed to create a very special laboratory research center for him in Waterloo um, that uh, he was going to go and where people at BlackBerry could go to think and create new ideas. And, of course, that building was sold when the company had to be downsized dramatically to survive. And Mike purchased the building uh, more than a year ago, and he's there now. He runs a, a venture capital firm that invests in a growing local ecosystem in the technology sector. One of the great things that happened to Waterloo is that when BlackBerry was forced to shrink dramatically, thousands and thousands of engineers went out and started on their own and have their own startups. So he now has a venture capital fund that invests in a lot of these startups. He's known most of all in Canada as a huge philanthropist at the University of Waterloo, the Perimeter Institute, Quantum Valley. He is full in into the future of quantum, quantum technology, quantum computing in particular. They have a huge center there, a lot of very, uh, very smart people, you know, looking at a future that probably won't be fully shaped uh, until long after we're gone. Um, but he's, he's full in on that, and he's got this marvelous energy and faith in this new future. Yeah, so he's not broken at all. He's, he has a second life after BlackBerry. Absolutely. Both of them do, but what I would say after having spent a great deal of time with them, I think that they are still traumatized by the speed with which they fell. Samuel Clemens, the Canadian uh, uh, author, um, who, is, who is the author of Mark Twain, who was forced to go on a speaking tour after his investment in printing press collapsed in the, the late 1800s. Famously, someone said to him, you know, how did you fail? He said, at first it was very slow, and then it was very fast. Yeah. And that is yeah. the BlackBerry story, because you touched on 2010, 2011. Think about what happened in those years. Those are the years that the storm and the playbook failed. They were investigated for, by the securities regulators for backdating of stock options. They had that three-day outage. Do you remember that three-day outage? They had riots in Indonesia, people lining up and, and stampeding to get the phone. 
they had two drunk salesmen on a plane that had to be arrested and restrained, who ate their way out of restraints on an airplane. It was just everything that could go wrong went wrong. And that's what happens when a business falls apart so quickly. Yeah. And um, what about Jim? Did he, uh, what, what kind of role does he play now in society, except uh, doing our war art <laughs> collection? He, he is having a bit of a coming out this year. He went deep into a tunnel after he left Blackberry. I think he also suffered a great deal of trauma and personal difficulty uh, by their inability to turn the company around. Uh, he'd had a terrible falling out with Mike Lazaridis. The board had lost faith in him because they didn't believe in his own vision of where the company needed to go. Um, so he kind of went into a retreat for a while. He is a major collector of art and has been for a long time. He's now taking more of a public role. He has invested a lot of, uh, he's donated a lot of money uh, to uh, ex exploration uh, in Canada's north. He funded a ship that discovered the ship of the Franklin Expedition in, in northern, in the north in, in Canada. So they discovered that last year. Uh, he's continuing to invest in businesses. He's got private ventures. He has no interest in going back into a public company. Interesting. So, but he is also on his way doing something useful with the money they have. Do you have any idea how what their personal uh, um, worth is? I think when both of them left the company, um, because they were able to exercise their stock options early enough, I think you can safely assume that each of them walked away with a couple of billion dollars. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have to feel guilty. Uh, we don't have to feel sorry for these uh, poor guys. Now, the Blackberry, um, Blackberry now with the, the new CEO. How is he? Uh, you 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 spend very little time on the book uh, in the book, and and he's doing interesting things. What what do you think? Uh, how he, how he's doing? I think John Chen has done a very masterful job of preventing this company from collapsing. It really looked like they were very close to bankruptcy proceedings, and I will give. Uh, Jim Balsilli and Mike Lazaridis credit because they left the company even though it was falling apart from a strategic point of view uh, at its foundation it was strong they had no debt they had billions of dollars in cash because Jim Balsilli was very conservative uh, uh, in terms of running the business and Mike Lazaridis still had uh, products in the cabinet if you will you look at uh, the Blackberry Classic and the Passport those are the Passport was uh, designed under Mike Lazaridis and the classic is a return, is, is an upgrade on the bold with an explorer that works, yeah. an operating system that works. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. It's a yeah. no-brainer. That thing should have been the first product Absolutely. in 2012. I mean, ah. I know, I know. But they couldn't execute. Now they're executing. They're getting it right. So they're slowly rebuilding their brand. I think that the thing that we have not heard from John, who is a great communicator. I remember the first time I met him, I thought, this is the communication you never had with Mike and Jim when they were in power because they were very publicity shy, very suspicious, and they were very tough with the media. It was very hard to have a candid conversation with them. John Chen is open. He projects confidence. Uh, he is a reassuring force. Yeah. He has sharply reduced this company. His focus is on software. I think it's on Qnix and on the Internet of all things. What is he? How is he going to tap into that? software and and apply it to devices technology that really needs that security that blackberry is known for a lot of people believe that there's a great future for qnix software in operating systems in cars think of driverless cars and the hacking risks um even even within entertainment systems within cars and communication systems yeah. Uh, yeah. hacking extends beyond mobile devices it's now mobile machinery so there's a I believe that there's a future there um, there's also, I think, a very interesting relationship now between Samsung and BlackBerry. Samsung does not have a solid enterprise business. BlackBerry does. The two of them are, have, have partnerships to explore uh, you know, uh, various products and software developments there. And I think this is going to be a long-term play. I don't think you're going to get a sudden and dramatic announcement. They have long-term investors that have no interest in selling this company at this point and at this price. Yeah. yeah. Who is, um, yeah, so I think John really does a great job in having a clear strategy, 
the the money seems to the the money uh, the, the 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 losses have seems to have stopped more or less. So uh, we'll see how how that goes. But he, you think he's a good communicator? Were you able for the book to talk with Jim and uh, and and Mike about yes. all this? Yes, we uh, we interviewed 120 people, and the uh, bulk of our interviews were based on um, probably 30 to 40 hours with each Jim and Mike. We interviewed them separately. Wow. So we had tremendous access to them. And to their credit, I think that their long-term interest was ensuring that Canadians, and particularly Canadian entrepreneurs, learn from their mistakes. It was very honorable how willing they were to share their stories with us. There was no conditions, no terms, and there really, we felt there was nothing we could not ask them. Okay, so everything they didn't do as CEOs, they did right when you wrote the book, you basically got access to their brains and to their feelings. That's right. Thank you for your interest. Bye-bye.